Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So thank you for coming to uh, one more installment of the uh, Center for Health Informatics and Bioinformatics uh, Distinguished Speaker Series. We're very happy and lucky today to have with us uh, Professor Ken Goodman, who is the director of the bioethics program of the University of uh, Miami. Uh, Dr. Goodman uh, was trained as a philosopher. His uh, PhD was in the philosophy of science, which makes him uh, the only non-clinician and non-scientist uh, faculty member of the School of Medicine of the University of Miami. Uh, this has not uh, precluded him, however, from becoming a foremost national and international expert in, in bioethics and uh, a, a, a very prominent member also of the medical uh, informatics uh, world. Uh, so it, it is a great pleasure today that we have the opportunity to listen to him uh, uh, telling us about uh, computational decision support at the bedside, the ethical policy and practical uh, dimensions uh, in an era of intelligent machines. So, Dr. Goodman, thank you for joining us today. So, thank you very much for that. Thank you for this opportunity. The, the uh, one way to think of this is there are a number of communities in, in the world and academia, and sometimes they exchange fluids and sometimes they don't. Uh, the bioethics community has been around for a while. You're familiar with ethical issues, uh, general issues of bioethics. Uh, and, uh, in, in the hospital, in, in every hospital in the world, we deal with end of life care. We deal with some quotidian issues with privacy. We worry about informed consent. Um, we talk about uh, or allocation of organs. The IT community worries in many cases about the same things, but from uh, an information technology perspective. One of the things I've enjoyed a great deal uh, it, to, to, to work on, uh, in part with colleagues through Amy and other organizations, but also to build at the University of Miami, is an emphasis on the relationship between ethics and health information technology. Uh, it, I, I, it used to be quite a cult. I mean, in fact, when I first started doing this, it was, it was a long time ago, comparatively speaking. Uh, it, was, it was narrow, it was quite a, quite a, a niche interest. Why, why, you know, we reckon there's some privacy issues if you have information on computers. But what are the other issues? Uh, and part of what the mission has been in the intervening time is to identify, to elucidate, to analyze those issues and to try in a way that I think those of you who are familiar perhaps with garden variety bioethics will appreciate that the job when you do ethics is not to ride around on a horse uh, with a sword and smite evildoers. That's, that's for faculty meetings. We don't want to do that. <laughs> What we, what we really want to do, uh, neither is it the other direction, holding hands in a circle and getting in touch with our feelings. That's really nice on Friday after sharing. What we really need to do is we need to identify what, what has in other contexts been called the way to ethically optimize the use of intelligent machines uh, in, in healthcare, or, or uh, uh, to construe more broadly, not just healthcare, but healthcare research, healthcare policy, and so forth. And so the opportunity here to talk a little bit about, about a very particular kind of application, namely computer programs that provide, that help make decisions, um, uh, and, and to give a, uh, to look at a particular case, namely prognostic scoring systems, seemed like it might be an engaging, if not provocative way to raise some of these issues and try and make plain how we are getting, or trying to get our heads around the challenges related to, to, to technology. Ethics, of course, is always thrived on new technology. Uh, if it weren't for organ transplantation, if it weren't for genetics, if it weren't for uh, left ventricular assist devices, we'd, we'd be twiddling our thumbs for the most part. Uh, but in fact, technology does loom large, and I'm of the view, uh, and, and I will succeed this afternoon if I convince you that this is important, that the most interesting, significant, and far-reaching technology that we've encountered in health uh, uh, in, in this generation and maybe, maybe in the last century has to do with information uh, because it affects everyone. And it raises issues that bear on every one of the other core topics in the bioethics canon. It matters in terms of informed consent. It matters in terms of privacy. It matters in terms of end of life care. It matters in terms of all of the things that, that, we, that we worry about. Except too few of us, uh, I'm not sure who the uh, us is, 
too few perhaps of those people who do ethics, or, and perhaps too few people in the IT community, have managed to um, annex to most their, their, their interests appropriately. And so, so part of our project here is to have a bit of a discussion about that, if you will. So um, let, me, let me just give a, uh, this, this is, is uh, one's never sure how many feet to fly at. Uh, uh, given the audience. So some of this will seem desperately uh, ordinary and quotidian, or you maybe you've never heard of it before. Uh, computerized Decision Support Systems is that unhappy acronym. I sent an email to somebody the other day, and it was entirely acronyms. It, I mean, there were a few connective tissues there, but it was basically a string of acronyms. And then, and then of course, my respondent said, that's too many TLAs, because that's a three-letter acronym. Uh, this is a four-letter acronym. We can use computerized decision support systems to make diagnoses, prognoses, uh, to help with practice guideline applications, uh, very often at the, at the very point of care. Uh, in the world of pharmacogenomics, which by the way is not going as well as we'd hoped, uh, but, but in pharmacogenomics and personalized medicine and all of that, that's not going to be done on three by five cards. That's going to be done by physicians and nurses and others sitting on, on consoles uh, try, trying to do various kinds of very complex, well, either, either database analyses or pattern matching or, or, or all of the above. And triage, because I want to spend, if, if there's time, to talk just a little bit about what might end up being the first large-scale public use of decision support so that ordinary people are aware of these. Namely, it'll be in an emergency. Um, we were talking earlier about the new film about, about, uh, about the, uh, this nasty virus that, uh, that, that, that kills millions of people. Um, the, the criteria that are being evolved now, that, are, that people are trying to adopt now for emergency preparedness, very often are using, uh, I'll get to them in a second, but are, are basically, we have a situation like this. Uh, I'm in your institution, and I'm on a ventilator. And you arrive, same institution, by the way, I've got the last ventilator. However many you have, they're full. You arrive, and it turns out that uh, and you're a physician. Uh, and you can take care of me, do a good job, except for the fact that this is a really nasty virus, I'm going to die from it. In your best clinical judgment, I'm going to die even though I'm on a ventilator. She will surely die if she does not get a ventilator. She's more likely to survive if she gets a ventilator than I will, and I'm already on the ventilator. By what mechanism, means, criteria, policy, do we take it away from me and give it to you? Now, we got through teaching you in medical school that your job is to me, you're a patient advocate, you're going to fight for me. Right? Uh, and, and maybe if you're her physician, you're in a real tight spot, maybe that's your physician, whatever. How does the institution make that assessment? How much store, with all due respect, do we place in your clinical judgment? Uh, if you're right, namely that I'm going to die no matter what, and if he's right, namely she'll live if she gets a ventilator, there's a strong case to be made for taking it away from me and giving it to her, right? You don't do that. It's sort of a very, very basic utilitarian calculus. Do the numbers. You keep it the way they things the way they are now, and you have two dead people. Okay. You you take it away from me and give it to her. Someone might survive. Okay. Wouldn't it be nice if, if if that were objective? Wouldn't it be nice if we could actually make assessments about ventilator allocation, or for that matter, any other kind of scarce resource allocation? So let's talk a little bit about the data sources that, and, and some of the issues that arise from them for all of these prognostic, diagnostic, and uh, <coughs> pardon me, resource allocation systems. Uh, and this is just for the, probably for the sake of completeness to, to, to get our juices flowing about what we think the most engaging points are for furthering the, the collaboration between the ethics and the health IT communities. So there are databases out there, and, and we, uh, we, we've already discovered the error rate in some databases. In fact, many of you know far more about this than I do, but I, I don't know of any perfect databases. Uh, and, and in fact, some of them are actually pretty buggy, and part of this, the, the analyses we do is how much, how much, what kind of an error rate is acceptable, what kind of a, what kind of a, a percentage or frequency, incidence and prevalence, if you want, uh, is acceptable in a large database. And the answer, depending on use, uh, even beyond that, is depend. So we're concerned about reliability and accuracy of these databases. This is true both for your decisions, your diagnostic expert system, or your prognostic scoring system, for instance. We also want to be able to draw data from electronic health records in real time. 
We also, and by the way, I mean, I, we, we were talking earlier about our, our Robert Wood Johnson, I'm not answering the phone. Um, uh, personal health records now, the popularity and use of all personal health records, either on devices you can carry or, or, uh, or web-based or what have you, is really becoming quite, quite, uh, quite, uh, quite high, especially for people with chronic maladies. Okay. So now we're concerned about information that my clinicians obtain for one purpose being used by you for a secondary purpose. Uh, and does, do you need to obtain consent from all the patients who are feeding data in your EHRs or or not, under what criteria? I should mention, I think there's a solution to this, by the way. Ethics, ethics is by thought by some people to be the, the identification, iteration, embrace, and savoring of intractable problems. Uh, I, I, that's a mistake, I think. Uh, I think that the use of the phrase ethical dilemma is, 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 uh, is far too frequent and rarely accurate. Uh, to, to be on the horns of a dilemma, a moral dilemma, remember, is to be in a situation where no matter what you do, you do something wrong. Uh, I think the, the, the utility of applied ethics is, is, in fact, to be able to make decisions that, that let us move forward in a way that, as I said earlier, was, was uh, uh, I'm not sure I like the phrase, but it's the best available, is ethically optimized. Okay. So what we've learned from our colleagues in public health is that it's not secondary use if you gathered it for that purpose in the first place. We make much about uh, the secondary use of EHR data, but in fact, I think you can make a very strong argument that, that if, if patients understood that much of the information is being collected, not just for their sake, but also for the health of communities, it smooths out some of that tension about secondary use. Disclosure, consent, and confidentiality, of course, closely, closely interrelated. We've also discovered that our patients will sign anything we ask them to sign. So uh, that, coupled with the fact that, not, not a good idea, not so a good ethical stance, I would suppose, but if you couple it with the following important fact, namely there's a growing body of empirical uh, uh, research that seems to show that ordinary people actually don't mind people they trust using their information especially if you're using it for public health or improving medical care. And in fact, in some jurisdictions, when you ask them, say, you mean you're not doing that already? In most, we, we have this picture, in some jurisdictions anyway, of patients, uh, quad data sources, as being very, very uh, uh, concerned about their information leaking out. Uh, what, we're, what the people are concerned are people who have maladies who fear either uh, uh, social ostracism or, or some loss of insurance benefits. As a general proposition, I think most people get it and they understand that biomedical research is intensive, information intensive and, and it would be irrational of them to not, to not want to, uh, to, to share their information. An empirical claim for which we need more, uh, we need more data. Uh, and then public health and epidemiology resources, in which case the information to gather for some purposes may not be suitable or applicable for others. There are others, but that, that sort of gets, gets things going for us, right? The challenge here, and what I think is very interesting, and, and before I, I, I say much more, I, I'm going to do a little survey. This has not been approved by the IRB. Um, how many physicians in the room? How many nurses in the room? How many computer scientists or informaticians of one flavor or another are in the room? Uh, how many uh, lawyers are in the room? No lawyers. How many scientists of other uh, sorts are in the room? How many none of the above are in the room? Bioethics. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> so, yeah, our, our philosophy or... Uh, I mean, philosophers are good. We, for, we forget our own so quickly. Um, okay, so, so if someone says, what's the, if you say to a medical student that I get to teach medical students, and I enjoy teaching medical students, and actually the University of Miami, which is in many respects just like, we have, can you imagine being in a university where different campuses are not in the same place? Uh, in Miami, they're in separate cities, you know. It's not, it's not like there's one campus and everything's together in the medical school you walk over to and the law school is just over around the corner. Uh, our, 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 our institutions are, are, are complex and multiply distributed. But you ask a kid who's aspiring to go to medical school, or for that matter, nursing school, to be, to be diverse, why do you want to do this? That, I tell them, they're going to ask you that, and, and you want to have a couple of answers, right? You want to think about this. You can say, 
And most of what you say, moreover, they've already heard before. So you're saying you want to help people, and you're going to say that you want to, you want to reduce suffering, and you're going to say that you want to serve society. You probably ought to say you're interested in biomedical science uh, or human biology or something or other. Um, you, there's certain things you don't want to say. Um, it's tr not true anymore, but for example, it would be bad during your medical school admissions uh, interview to say, I, I, I hope to acquire vast personal wealth from the misfortunes of sick people. That, uh, we advise students not, not to do that. What you, want, what, what you want to do is you want to be able to reduce human suffering in one way or another. You want to cure disease when you can, you want to manage it when, 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 uh, when that's not possible. And even at the end of the day, what we're teaching all of our students is you need to know some more palliative care. It's a new specialty. Uh, the palliative care uh, specialists are becoming, are quite in demand. <coughs> I beg your pardon. Um, and, and we've solved a problem that we thought was, was, might be intractable, namely that it's okay to terminate treatment, it's okay to provide comfort measures only, and, and let patients die. The, the patients and families may not, may not agree in, in particular instances, but generally speaking, that's a bit of progress, I would argue, in the world of bioethics. But all of these things, curing, managing, and palliating, can be done in principle or not, I mean, that's probably the, the metaphysical discussion we'll, we'll have time for tomorrow at this time, um, by Watson. Uh, in fact, you remember at Amy last year, the, the IBM team that built Watson for Jeopardy is now working on a medical Watson. And if you follow the literature, those of you who know this know it, those of you who don't, don't, uh, but in many pretty well-designed studies of decision support systems, both for diagnoses and prognoses, computers do better than humans. They do better than human experts. So the provocative question for us is, what is it about the practice of medicine, or nursing if you like, that's necessarily human? Imagine a really good, large, perfect computer with good language skills, the infallible memory, uh, access to lots of stuff uh, more quickly than we can get it, no bias, which is very nice, and they tend to get it right when you want them to get it right. What is it about the practice of medicine that, if you were a group of pre-med students, I would say to you, given the fact that the machines are smarter than you, and more accurate than you, and more reliable than you, and less biased than you, what is it about the practice of medicine that, you're, 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 that, that means so much to you? So let me give you, so here's our, here's our case study. Um, uh, our colleagues in bioethics, how, how long have we been dealing with the futility problem? Yeah. Decades. Decades. Uh, the literature, it's, you, you, you could, it'd be interesting for someone to track the, 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 uh, the periodicity of articles on futility and match them against something in the economy or, or something else. <clears throat> the, 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 what is it, how, how is futility to be defined in clinical context? In fact, uh, Stuart Younger wrote a wonderful paper uh, about, about the definition of futility. In other words, is there, are there things that we do to patients in hospitals that just that, 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 are, that are inappropriate, either because they're, they're, they, they won't work physiologically, or they won't extend life, or they won't improve the quality of life, or, or, or some other such thing, right? Um, the, it talks on futility outside of information technology. We talk about the old, the, 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 the classic example from Greek mythology of, of uh, the attempt to move water from the cistern to the well with a sieve. You just can't do it. You can do it fast, you can do it for a long time, it won't matter, it won't work. Okay. So, so one of the definitions, one of the ways, uh, the sources is physiological futility. Um, uh, in, do you have this problem in New York? In Miami we have a problem where patients with, with viral diseases regularly request uh, prescriptions for antibiotics. That happen a lot here? In Miami we actually, they actually get them too, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, but there's a good example of something that's, that's just not going to work. It just doesn't work. You should, you should not prescribe antibiotics to people with viral infections. Um, that's one way to think of futility. Another way is, is, is sort of more probabilistically, namely, uh, according to, 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 to one, one account, uh, if something hasn't worked in the last 100 cases that you've had, it's not going to work on the 101st. Well, it might, but that's not the way to bet in any case, right? 
<coughs> and then there's the, 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 the interest in, in policy and the law. Tada actually is not tada. It's the it, although it might be. That's the actually the the the, uh, the Texas Advanced Directive Act. One state in the United States actually has passed a law that says that if you go through this process, if the medical team goes through a process that includes communication and offering to transfer and second opinions, if at the end of the day a patient or a family is still insisting on something that you believe is not medically appropriate, you don't have to do it. The problem for many physicians in many jurisdictions is they're afraid that if they don't go through this therapeutic frenzy, they're going to get sued. And so we regularly overtreat patients at the end of life because either the patient or a family member is insisting on it. It, it almost always fails. Uh, in Texas, they passed a law that would actually indemnify physicians uh, uh, who actually went through this policy. It's a, it's a, it's a bit of, it's a liability protection for having a process that lets you, lets you make a judgment that a particular intervention is clinically futile. We just went the wrong direction, did we? Um, so let's talk about clear cases. Uh, are there uncontroversial cases of futility? Sure there are. Antibiotics for viruses are a really good example. Uh, there may be others too. In fact, I think everybody who's practiced medicine or nursing can probably identify several of them. There are certain kinds of things that one just can't do. By the way, are there any surgeons here by any chance? Any surgeons? Um, have you ever noticed that if you refer a case to a surgeon and the surgeon says, I'm sorry, I can't do it, is not, a patient's not a candidate, we say, but people in internal medicine would say, okay, well, thank you. We go back to the patient and say, sorry, not a candidate. And then the family copes with that somehow or other, right? If someone says, I'd like a liver transplant, and you refer me to the transplant division, and they say, sorry, not a candidate, we go back, and someone goes back and tells the family, sorry, not a candidate, and they cope with that. Have you noticed that we do not insist on futility policies from, from surgeons? Was, if in the surgeon's judgment you cannot accomplish what, what what, uh, what seems to, to be required to save the patient's life, that judgment seems to be adequate to the task. And yet when it comes to dialysis or resuscitation, or the things that very often happen in critical care units or, or in, in, uh, in divisions that are, not, they're not, uh, that are not surgical, we now are saying, well, we need to do it anyway. We need to give it a go because we're afraid of liability. Can there be justification to provide non-trivial treatment in these cases? In other words, if in your judgment I'm dying, do you have to dialyze me if I'm in renal failure? And the answer is, well, the dialysis might keep me alive for a while longer, but relative to the goals of the treatment, it's very unlikely to, to achieve a goal that, that seems to any reasonable person to be worthwhile. Although one could say, if you're the family member, I value him being alive for a week longer. And in that narrow physiologic way, it's not futile. Uh, there's also what we call, what, what I've just called there, the lottery problem. Uh, the lottery problem is, is this. Uh, the people who create the greatest challenges in our institutions by insisting on treatment at the end of life or elsewhere that's not appropriate have, uh, because they're members of just, just ordinary, ordinary civilians, right, have, have a I should put this, a limited understanding of statistics and probability. That's why they buy lottery tickets. Um, and and uh, this will sound terrible. I heard somebody once describe a lottery as a tax on the stupid. That sounds mean. I, I don't like that at all. I, I buy lottery tickets. But it's not because I expect to win, you see. It's because for a dollar or whatever, I have a justified fantasy that I'm going to have about what I do when I win. It's very strategic. So, but we are dealing with people who buy lottery tickets as an investment strategy, and they're the same ones asking you to provide treatment that you believe won't work. Okay, so here are a couple of prognostic scoring systems. There are many others. These are, these are, these are uh, the ones that are, that are, that are best known. Um, Apache, Acute Physiology and Chronic Health Evaluation International, what is it, IPSS, the International uh, Prognostic Scoring System revised for evaluating, for evaluating prognostic scoring systems. The, so, the Sequential Organ Failure Assessment Score. We're talking about emergency preparedness. It turns out that the groups of people trying to decide what criteria should be used for allocating resources in the case of an emergency have said that the modified SOFA score actually provides a pretty good criteria for you deciding who you're going to triage and who you're not going to, to and who you're not going to. I mean, who do you treat and who do you not treat? 
So here are examples of some of these, as there are many others. A lot of the predictive modeling that, that, that's being done quite so, so beautifully here and elsewhere is in many cases about that. If you've never seen, though, what, what here, here's a screenshot from, this is fake, but I'm not fake, this is, uh, 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 it's a, uh, uh, a screenshot from an Apache score uh, for a number of different patients. The patients' names are all made up. Um, but you can see, is there an arrow here? Let's see. Yeah, you can see that. So for example here, uh, this patient here, Alexander, Al Alexander is, is, uh, is got a really bad score. Uh, his hospital risk of mortality, 96%. The ICU, 92%. He's fixing to die. Right? And others are, are much better here. You'd much rather be, you know, you'd much rather be over here with, with Lois, right? This is, these, once again, these are all uh, uh, artifacts to put together to illustrate different different degrees of of, uh, of the score. The the challenge with this is, I think, quite interesting. On the one hand, for a prognostic scoring system, it's unbiased and unemotional. Uh, they, they can be used on very large databases uh, without uh, uh, human memory. The, psych the people, psychologists who discovered uh, the, uh, physician memory have basically found that most physicians remember f more or less uh, with useful detail about 100 cases, uh, the 100 most recent ones plus noteworthy ones beyond that, right? And they're also in many circumstances highly accurate. Okay. Why not? Why not introduce in, in, in your hospital the use of a prognostic scoring system that when it has a score for me, that's, and you have a committee, the ethics committee, of course, would be asked to help uh, uh, write this. Um, if your score is, 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 is uh, a certain level, we're actually not, we're going to use that to make judgments about how to take care of you. So uh, I, I think I only refer to it as, uh, there's one of the, one of the uh, these images, uh, uh, we coined the phrase computational futility index, CFI. It's accurate, it's unbiased, they're increasingly cheap. If you know that your critical care patient is not going to survive hospitalization, why don't we basically have the family sit down at the next conference and say, we've actually done an analysis, and nothing we can do is going to, to achieve any goal that any reasonable person wants. Therefore, we're done. Yes? Uh, so I'm a critical care doc, and I do a lot of work in the staff realm. And when I try to present information to patients in that way, there's always the 1%. So can you, and in fact, the other week, a patient's family member were actually asked me to state, can you say I'm 100% sure your mom will die? And I, I mean, I, it's a difficult situation. For many reasons, but it's, that, it's it's not. I mean, there's no question there's accurate on the extremes of illness, um, but there's always that caveat of patients who we haven't put into the prognostic scoring system creation, which we can't account for. Right, and, and what we've learned also is that sometimes so so you're getting you're getting toward the punchline. Uh, that, uh, one of the things, by the way, that we we try and do this is this is probably related to ordinary people's understanding of, of probabilistic concepts. What we try and teach medical students is try, if at all possible, to avoid talking statistics with patients. The, the, there are people who will insist on you doing something that has a likelihood of succeeding that is lower than their risk of being hit by lightning. I mean, they never alter their behavior. I mean, by the way, the risk of being struck by lightning, depending on where you are, about one in 8,000. But if you say, well, there's a one in 10,000 chance of surviving, they're going to say, well, I'm good. You say, well, but it's costing $4,000 a day. You say, so it's okay. The, 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 the church and businesses will pay for it. Whatever it's pays for health care these days. Um, and, and what you see is a misunderstanding of what's involved between here and there. One way, one thing that I found when we, when we do ethics consults with families that are asking to play long shots with some, have you ever, hmm, rarely are they paying for it themselves, right? It's very easy to gamble with someone else's money. Um, but it's also very easy to gamble with someone else's life. That is to say, a lot of people have uh, the, the view that there's nothing lost by giving it a go. In other words, if you can succeed, you're a really good intensivist. Why, why not save my mother's life, right? And what they don't understand is that, one, you're overwhelmingly unlikely to succeed, and the course between there and that is rough, 
not just in terms of cost. It's, it's her last days on earth, or weeks, or whatever, are going to be miserable. Uh, she's probably going to be unconscious. All the things that, are, that, that occur, and she'll die anyway. Uh, and if she succeeds, it's not like she's going to be back at baseline. She just won't be dead. Right? We, we see this case um, all over and over again where people think they value what, when they're in the breach, they really don't, I think, value. Uh, this came up, uh, I come from Florida, which is a very, very interesting state um, for a number of different reasons. Uh, but the best thing is we're not picking presidents for y'all anymore. But, but, but otherwise, um, uh, we get some very interesting cases. The most noteworthy end of life care ever, case ever uh, was a Florida case. Uh, about about uh, poor, poor, poor Terry Schiavo, uh, a woman who had been in persistent vegetative, permanent vegetative state for 15 years, uh, and there were people seriously suggesting that that was just fine. Uh, I think that most ordinary people, to quote a colleague of mine, what we value is simply, it's not that we value being alive, we value that a lot, but what we value about life is simply not, not being dead. Those two negatives were important. I really am glad I'm not dead as long as there's something else going on. And the problem with these, well, what about the one chance that you might be mistaken, doctor, in your, in your probabilistic assessment of my future, is it's not simply, well, let's give it a go. Nothing lost if, 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 if we're wrong 999 times out of, out of the thousand, right? Uh, and and it's, 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 it's partly based on lottery problem idea. I mean, pe there are people who actually think, who think they might win the lottery. And therefore, they think they're going to win yours. Yes? Um, I used to do a little bit for critical care, so I can empathize with that scenario. Um, more recently, I've been involved with a group that's uh, discussing the issue of limb solvers versus amputation. And ironically, uh, I've witnessed some patients that have demanded that everything be done for limb salvage when a number of very experienced surgeons said it's, it's got to be amputated. So. Um, and the, the limbs survive for more than a year. It looks ugly, it's partially functional, but they're happy and, and they're living without an amputation. So these people are younger than many of the people that are facing end of life issues. So you have to factor in the area and the curve for the future and contrast the total cost, dollars plus uh, emotional. And uh, I don't know how to do that, but it's a fascinating Scenario. Right, and what we're, when we start thinking about this, we're discovering lots of others as well. This comes up, by the way, we use prognostic scoring systems in pediatrics, or the pediatric ICU. Uh, th these systems are less accurate for, kid, for, for children than they are for adults. For adults, they're more accurate over the, uh, the, in the near period. The longer you, the patient can stay alive, the more you falsify the results of the pr prognosis, right? Um, and, that, and, that, and that can happen every once in a while. What, Part of it is the phrase do everything leaked into the vocabulary and I wish it never had because do everything is actually kind of vague. Do everything is elliptical or it used to be elliptical or it ought to be elliptical for do everything within reason that to achieve a goal that, 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 to, to achieve some good. Uh, there are people who Look, I mean, what do you do with a patient who refuses the, the amputation when, when the amputation is, ne is, is, is necessary to save a patient's life? And you say, you really would rather live, would be rather be dead than have an amputation? And there's some people who will say yes. Uh, is that evidence of incapacity? That's a great question. Um, but but it, the, it's the phrase, do everything, that makes it seem like swinging for the fences is always a reasonable option. Because the fact of the matter is, you might make it worse in the process. That's why the very, the very availability of hospice uh, in end-of-life care, at least, may not apply in your case, but in end-of-life care, it says, you know something, there are things we value beside immortality. Uh, and, and they can be, given the inevitability of our dying, yeah, it, uh, uh, it's, it's very easy to say when you're not yourself uh, 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 dying, uh, and I understand that. But, but would you rather have a peaceful, dignified, comfortable passing a week or a month early than you would have, uh, you know, be, be, be unconscious that time with a bunch, you know, and intubated and everything else? People very often ask for this for their family members and never ask for it for themselves, which suggests there's a lot more going on here, at least, well, at least again, in, in, in some cases. Um, the, 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 
but, but what goes to your point, and maybe to yours also, is one, they are probabilistic. They're not infallible. You might be wrong. Uh, that, that if you change your, you're changing decision making uh, to increase use of immediately available data about other patients. So my Apache system, for example, um, is, is, uh, is about other people. I have the quaint old idea that if you're making judgments for me, you're making them based on me not based on a, on a crosshash of me through your database, right? It seems like there's something about that that's not, well, I don't know, it's not, it's not what we think of physicians doing when, when they're doing it, right? There's also the question, uh, the stifling innovation question, uh, that I'm, I'm troubled by. I'm not sure what I want to say about it. By the way, every one of these, I'm convinced, is a research program yet to be realized. Apropos our conversation earlier. Uh, the literature on all of these questions is really quite meager. There's a lot of literature, scientific literature, but not literature of the sort that's having these discussions. Namely, what, what values ought to be brought to bear when we use intelligent machines at the bedside? That's easy to say and very, very difficult, I think, to, to make full. It stifles innovation uh, in the following way, if you buy this. Um, namely, that if I get a bad score and you say, Ken, that's it, we're, we're done, uh, then you're not going to try things that might have played out those probabilistic uh, uh, opportunities and learn something in the process. Uh, a lot of innovation in medicine comes from giving it a go, even when the odds are bad. Right? Now, I'm not sure how, how, uh, how much that matters in this context, uh, but it certainly needs to be on the table. Right? It also, sort of the related point that's been made is it, it proves a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once you've decided that I'm going to die and you stop treating me, then I'm going to die. Uh, whereas, had you given it a go, you, given the fact that you're fallible, you are fallible, aren't you? Okay. Then, then, then in fact, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's going to end exactly the way you predict when you stop. So, decision, um, I, I'm of the view that our, the whole debate over evidence-based medicine and translational research has overlooked a very interesting problem. And it's a problem about probability how to analyze it, how to communicate it to patients, and how to make decisions under it. Uh, we want answers. We want to be able, for as, mu for as much as the clinicians here will disdain, as well you should, uh, cookbooks that say, look down column A, row B, like they're the cheesiest kind of practice guidelines. The fact of the matter is when you're in a tight spot, you are in search of what, I don't think anyone here is old enough. Uh, well, maybe they still call them this in some places, the clinical pearls. There are a bunch of if-then conditionals that basically say, you know, I'm not sure what to do here, but my colleague who's really smart and whom I respect says, if this, then do that, right? Uh, that's a kind of practice guideline, thank you very much, right? Um, the debate over evidence practice, recall to those of us who, who've tried to follow it, uh, has been in, in some sense a debate about the hierarchy of different kinds of knowledge. This is an epistemological question. Is the randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial the gold standard against which everything should be measured? And I'm, of, I'm in the camp that says, well, it's imperfect, but it's the best we've got. Uh, that infuriates people uh, who, who are troubled by evidence-based practice and say, I want to be able to spend a lot more time on my individual patient's pathophysiology and my clinical judgment, um, whatever that is. Uh, clinical judgment, of course, by these machines is, is really quite accurate. And so uh, I would want to know whether or not what their view is about using decision support systems is. Uh, and there's also the question of, of, uh, that we've learned from our colleagues in epidemiology, namely the, 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 the bidirectional, bidirectional inferential strategies of going from individuals to populations and vice versa. Uh, you, you, might, you just might be wrong. Uh, that's the problem with induction, and that's the problem that we face. So here are a couple of dicta, which I think could, spot, could, could support uh, 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 a, a discussion, which I don't have a lot of time for. Will that be okay to have to, uh, um, We'll be done by midnight, though, we promise. Mm -hmm. to, to be able to, to say, here, here are some pronouncements, which I think uh, you might agree with or not agree with. I'll share my views if you insist. Uh, but, but what do you think about these as a, as a first approximation? The computers calculate and humans practice medicine. So let's uh, sink in for a while. Uh, Randy, so this is our, our colleague, uh, uh, Randy Miller, uh, and now at Vanderbilt, is famous for saying, the computer no more replaces what's in here than the stethoscope does. It's a cognitive uh, or, or perceptual enhancing tool, right? 
nevertheless, when you write the sort of things that we need to write, it's still, you still need to leave open the idea that um, um, you have to imagine a, a medical Turing machine. That's a good phrase, right? I've never heard that phrase. Has anyone ever used it? A medical Turing machine where, where basically it always, it, you, you can't tell the difference between the, the, uh, the, the, the remember the Turing machine is a computer, or the Turing test is a test of, uh, of, uh, of computing power such that a human can't tell the difference between the computer and the human behind the wall, right? So imagine you had a medical computer that was as perfect as, as a human clinician in all respects, except perhaps, we even have surgical robots that are really, well, don't say it, don't say it. Yes, that, that, depending on what you're the only one, the only one. The, one. the one that you really want med students to say they care about. Human contact. Uh, which is related to, to communication, and that sort of thing. Although, even then, so human contact, human communication, what would you say to the diagnostic robot and some of the robots are getting very nice, you know, they're, right? they, 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 they're very sensitive. They're, they're very, they're very uh, I'm mean, not sensitive, sensitive. Well, maybe they are sensitive, I don't know. Uh, but they can, we've done remote presence telesurgery now. You know, we've done, we've done uh, pancreatectomies in dogs in other countries and that sort of thing. Suppose, here's, here's the study, that, that according to certain kind of outcomes, clinical outcomes, human contact doesn't matter. I'm not, I'm not saying that's true. I'm imagining what, if, what happens if these guys do a research study and shows that in terms of longevity, uh, quality of life, or, or, or other sorts of things, it turns out that human contact plays a personal role. I, I would only say that the technology that you use in the diagnosis, in the diagnosis and treatment of patients affects the doctor-patient relationship. So when you use the, the introduction of the stethoscope, the introduction of the x-ray, the introduction of the MRI, all that changes how patients and physicians feel about each other. Uh, it may be essential, yes. Anything that benefits the care of patients, we'd argue, needs to be exactly like that. The, pro the provocative point that I want to make, not because I want to make it, not because I believe it, but because I think we think too little about it and we are unprepared for the computers that will, in fact, be nearly flawless in their predictions and nearly flawless in their analyses and be able to tell you the course of it, be able to do these things is that the role of the human, need, we need to clarify that role. Is the computer a tool or is the computer a surrogate? And somebody somewhere along the line is going to try and build a, a, a Watson that's going to have a nice voice, it's going to interact properly, it's going to have a robotic hand that's going to feel soft uh, and, and you may discover at the end of the day that patients don't care. I, I hope that's not true. I have the same sentiment, if you will, that you do, but I'm also mindful of the fact that it's a sentiment, and I'm trying to find out, and I think that our collective mission is at the, at the scene between the IT and the ethics communities is, what is it about these sciences uh, that, that we find so troublesome? What, what is it about, about the robot, the robodoc, that we find so offensive? And the, well, I guess the patient doesn't want to see a robot per se, or the patient wants to get well. And if the patient has reason to believe the robot will provide a greater chance of that than the human, then am I, what am I going to, you know, the, the, uh, there's this great line from uh, the, uh, Saul Bellow, the great American writer, talks about he used to go get hair tests. Not because he needed a haircut, but because he liked some human touching him instantly in a way that was socially acceptable, right? For money. Uh, you, know what, you know what I mean. Um, I, and, and, and we know, I mean, I, I suspect there's a little Munchausen's in every patient, right? There are people who go to doctors because they, because you get very special attention. Uh, it's intimate, it's trusted, it's based on an ancient, really, truly quite ancient set of values and exchanges. We, and, and we know up till now that the thing to do is go to your physician because she will, in fact, make you comfortable and save your life. She'll do what, what it is we believe best it's supposed to do. What I'm worried about is, 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 the, the, the slippage toward, toward, uh, toward, toward hard, reliable, successful data applications and whether that matters for the practice of medicine and how we ought to manage it and prepare for it and stake out 
not for sentiment's sake, but for strategy's sake, what the uniquely human contributions are. Yes? Um, I was just going to say that in terms of what patients are going to value in these interviews, I think the, the other element is how much they feel like there's someone caring for them, someone's advocating for them. Um, some, like, if a robot is caring for them, you might get good results, but if things go sour, uh, patients will you know, who's, who's got on back. I think that's, that's a huge element of the, the value. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really hard to model. It's hard to write software that does that, right? Uh, the question in the breach is how much of what patients value from medicine is, relies on that. Uh, and that's an empirical question, too. I mean, we can find out. We can say, all right, for those areas of medicine where that kind of touching, contact, communication, trust, advocacy, I mean, these, these, are, these are crucial values. They're, they're, I mean, you, you should not be admitted to medical school if you don't believe that those are really good values. We don't debate the value of a, pa a physician being an advocate for, for a patient or the doc of, of the shared decision-making model of doctor and patient. A little bit paternalistic here, a little less there, that's okay. As long as, as, long as I can talk to you about these, these probabilistic things and we can arrive at these decisions. Uh, puzzles like amputation, puzzles like uh, managing disability and that sort of thing are great puzzles. And, and I'm, I'm, my intuition is pretty much the same as yours. This is not all about data. Did you hear that? Yeah, I was thinking about, um, you know, do you want a human taking care of you because maybe there's a shared human experience and there's some empathy there? Uh, and I was thinking of the question that some of the doctors sometimes cringe when a patient says, you know, what would you tell your mother? Or what, what, what care would you want for your mother? And I'm thinking about this robot. Well, no, a really good robot will say, it's not my mother. As a, as a really good robot will say exactly what the physician, in some circumstances, ought to say. Namely, your mother's values are different than my mother's values, so asking what my mother would do or what I would do if it were my child, right? I think sometimes it's okay to answer that question because the fact of the matter is I'm asking you to play your hunch for me because I've got no more informed a hunch than you do, right? Uh, and then if you're wrong, well, I gave it the best shot, and you did, and, and that's that's where that's where we are. That's okay to do. Um, it's the it's the, the 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 humanity of it, the je ne sais quoi of it, the loosey goosiness of empathy, that that we value a great deal, and, and and ought to value a great deal. The question is, in a world of of of, of uh, high tech medicine, pharmacogenomics, a lot of people one would argue I haven't had I haven't had that kind of intimate empathy and shared decision making in a long time anyway. Thanks very much for the sentimental. But the last time I was in the hospital, it was a factory anyway on the computer and site. Um, to um, I you know I, I I I'd rather I'd rather be warm and fuzzy, but I also rather live. And if and if. Watson can ensure that better than, than Smith over here, well, then, then that's what I'm going to bet on, right? I find these unsettling questions. I find this really quite unsettling. I hope you do, too. I think we're at an era, we're at a juncture where the use of intelligent devices, not just in medicine, but many other sort of places, is really, is really uh, 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 one of the most interesting challenges we face. In other indus uh, industries, see what I've done? In other areas of human activity, medicine is not an industry. Don't let anyone ever call it an industry. Uh, but they do call it, it's a part of the economy now, right? The, uh, in, in aviation, there are certain airplanes where you, know, you, you, you really don't want the pilot trying to do it himself. <laughs> There's just too much going on. And uh, you know, we, we, we were romanticized by Neil Armstrong at the last minute saying, I'm sorry, I'm going to grab the stick. But, but as often as not, that's a surefire way to make a mistake. Sometimes the amount of data that's being processed is so high uh, that with what we want, you know what you want? You want to be able to say, let the force be with you. And you just go into this zone and you grok it where only a human can do that. I want, I want that to be true, I really do. But I'm afraid it's not. I'm afraid at the end of the day, if you're a pilot, and you, have you seen this new, this new Air, uh, Airbus plane, the really, the really big one? This is an enormous flying machine, and and it's and and I, I, I mean I think the pilot, the first ones to do it I think they actually could fly it, but you could fly it you know from a desk elsewhere too you know it's like these guys flying the drones you know and, and right it's all it's all very delicate stuff with very precise servo actuators and and, and uplinks and it's like video games, 
And that's the skill that seems to be required. Not that I'm going to grab the stick and land it, Mabel. I, I, as I, I'm, I'm as troubled by this as, as you seem to be, which is why I think there's a teaching, a learning and teaching moment here for our colleagues who are, who are writing these programs. It'd be irresponsible. Well, so the question that I want to continue with is, is some of these questions. And, and it may be that the first one is really the most important one when it puts you. <clears throat> While we're in this period, and right, for the foreseeable future, there is no robo doc that's, that's that good in all ways. Uh, in part because there is something about empathy, there is something about trust. Uh, people lie to their physicians now, and it makes the job even more difficult. But maybe they tell the truth more to the, to the computer. I don't know. It goes in both directions. It goes in both directions. Physicians lie to their patients. Well, I have. I've heard that too. Uh, but but the but the question is, as the technology evolves, I'm very interested in the following question. If there's reason to believe, and there is, uh, in, from, from oncology to cardiology to hepatology, that you really ought to be using a decision support system, we will cross a tipping point where it becomes blameworthy not to use one. And now we know most people overwhelmingly don't. Uh, some of these, by the way, are uh, depending on, whether, uh, on various uh, challenges related to intellectual property are on the web. I mean, patients can do them, which raises another great question. Namely, should, should these tools be shared with uh, patients and family members? I mean, would you, give, would you give your patient an Apache score? Why? Because I don't actually think that that accurately is a lot of the patients. I see there are more active surgical patients than Apache score. So it's a surgical, I see. I mean, I guess the question is, I, 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 I'm your patient's brother. Wait, the score, no, but I may discuss it in terms of, clearly I have issues with this, in terms of what their probability, um, oh, their is, likelihood of death is. is I a, do discuss that. It's highly likely based on what we know from other patients that you not know who that person, but you have a number of ones. What do you think, I'm just interested question, what do you think they'd say if you could say, look, we actually used a computer and we compared mom to a database with, with 40,000 other patients. And everybody else by the same data, who had her profile physiologically, everybody else has died. Would you, would you frame it like that? Yeah. I, I, I'm sure I'll put you on the spot. I mean, yes, in some cases. Yeah. 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 struggle with the garbage in, garbage out issue with the computer. So all of these are based on regression analyses at some level or more um, analyses at some level. So I, I worry often that my patient population that I'm applying this to is not included in the population that was counted. Uh, well, but that's, so, you know, no, that's very important. The best that we have is true. And I, I totally support clinical students who work in creating one. But there's that. I mean, one of the points you make also is one of the challenges for evidence-based practice in general. I mean, that practice guideline was written based on research from patient cohort that doesn't look like yours, or where the patient in front of you Tuesday at noon it doesn't, yeah. doesn't, doesn't line up with that cohort. No, that's, that's a, well, that's what we began with, the, 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 the questions of accuracy and reliability about the sources of information from which we're driving these, these inference, running, on, on which we're running these inference engines. But, Nevertheless, there, there will be a tipping point, and it may have already been reached in some places, and yet many of our colleagues, certainly outside of academia, I think, are, are really quite reluctant to, to do this. If there are lawyers here, there's a great legal question, um, and, uh, and, and it turns on the question. Uh, suppose you want to sue somebody. Suppose you use a decision support system or pro and to, to come up with a diagnosis, and it's wrong. Who do we sue? Do we sue you for not recognizing that it was wrong, or do we sue the manufacturer of you because you made this uh, database and, and, and soft wrote the software that made a mistake? Right? You're going to say, hey, he was a learned intermediary. He should have known that. He's going to say, wait a second. The master that talked about how complicated all this stuff was, large databases are more accurate. I, in other words, you sort of negligence or strict liability, which is a great problem, which is why I'm keen to try and have, you know, LC, if you know the LC acronym, ethical, legal, and social issues, which the Human Genome Program adopted as part of this vision. I am convinced that health information technology, health informatics, needs to have a more robust LC, LC program to address legal issues as well. Um, so when, when should, when's it wrong not to use a tool that it's been, that for which there's good reason to believe it will improve the care or the accuracy of patients? Uh, we've been talking about prognoses now. With diagnoses, do you feel different? 
uh, there the idea is to prolong a life, right? If you got it right and with finer granularity. I mean, you can do, you, I know people do this now. It's a beautiful thing for education, right? Not only do you get a diagnosis, you get a bunch of differentials and their probabilities. And that can be really good. You do a lot of fun or, or quite useful, right? Depending, depending on the malady. Um, should software be open to public scrutiny? And what is the role of vendors? Uh, some, some prognostic scoring systems are, are sold as quality tools. Namely, you can compare how your, the quality of your critical care unit to mine, or yours last year, this year, and that, and that sort of thing. That's, that's really good. But one of the issues that we're finding with this is that, is that there's a lot of uh, there's, there are intellectual property issues. The vendors of the systems, all the work that we do, who, who in your hospital, what, what company uh, uh, did you make your own uh, electronic health system? Yeah. Um, why not CERN or Siemens or GE? I found out this problem in my institution. General Electric, GE makes a really good fetal monitor. But the hospital has a CERN system. But GE makes systems. Guess what? All of our talk about interoperability, uh, basically, look, it's, it's, it's like trying to plug so it's like if I, if I were to plug that drive, that, that PC drive into the Mac uh, thing, right? It doesn't work. And so you have this beautiful, and apparently uh, the obstetricians uh, uh, really like this fetal monitor, but they got to store the data separately because there's no pipe that takes it into the service system. So, um, so, so some of the challenges we face are, are, are not ours, not our fault. They're, they're the fact that we live in the economy that we live in. And, and, and electronic health records have become another medical product. Uh, there's a big debate, parenthetically, and, and here's another wonderful, here's the policy issue. This is the, the social policy issue. Namely, should our, our electronic health records, or is your prognostic scoring system a medical device? Should, it, no, should that is it be regulated? Uh, that's a debate that we've had for a long time. The argument, the no argument, very in brief and parenthetically, the, uh, I, I, when, I'm sorry, I've, I've, I was looking around for a clock and I realized I took this off earlier. Uh, we need to wrap up pretty soon or no? 4.30. Oh, okay, good. So, so that's, that's good. Okay. Um, this discussion, of course, is, is, uh, is, is a great one. The challenge, the challenge that we have is on the one hand, people say that the go if, if you really want the FDA, which you've starved to death now for decades, start looking, reading through millions of lines of code, they're never going to finish anything, right? Uh, on the other hand, uh, and, and moreover, have a chilling effect on creative design. I mean, that's a, that's a, real, that's a real interesting point. On the other hand, where's that tipping point where the code that we're writing and using in direct patient care really ought to be something that somebody else ought to be looking at. These are not mere toys. No matter what, well, no matter what disclaimer you write, if, if, a, if a physician is using a machine to take care of a patient, what's the principal difference between whether the machine is one that's uh, helping the ears or helping the, uh, right, or helping the brain? And I think that's another wonderful moment, uh, wonderful topic of, of debate. It's uh, reasonable people disagree about that. Helping to make the point that I began with, namely that ethics is not about arm waving, I've been waving my arms a bit, but it's not about passing judgment and arm waving. It's about managing reasonable disagreement in a way that serves broader social values. In this case, broader values about how to take care of patients who, no matter how good the robot is, are still scared, they're still sick, they still feel really bad. And, the, um, the, the question of vendors, I don't know if you saw this, this, this keeps coming up because these are proprietary devices. Um, is, 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 is your software like a drug? That is to say, when you do work on software, and I'm in the case of Microsoft, you know what I mean, uh, is, is the developing of intelligent tools in biomedicine like the development of new pharmaceutical products? Say more. Because it's not uh, coming up or you know exactly what you want to achieve. You know, try many different things and combinations of them. It's more directed, like it, compared to the drug bill. Okay. Should should you be able? Yes, please. I was going to say that you could imagine it as a therapeutic maneuver, not to the individual person, but to the community or the uh, subset of healthcare. Uh, if you have an information system that says encourages people to uh, order beta blockers, then you're actually manipulating the behavior of clinicians to, uh, to change their practice. So you're influencing the, uh, the hospital and the way it's provided. 
should uh, what sorts of we actually do regulate you know, we, if the software is implanted right we regulate uh, stuff in, in, in uh, pace makers and the and that sort of thing but that kind of is an interesting question mm -hmm. it? sorry i'm sorry sometimes moving around is good unless of course there's somebody who's trying to track the camera i apologize um, as i was trying to run away The models that we've evolved for looking at these things seem, in retrospect, to be kind of quaint, I want to say. The whole IP environment that grew up under pharmaceuticals uh, is one that doesn't transfer nicely to software, right? Uh, one of the problems that we have uh, with, with, with medical software is how complicated it is and, and what it would take to license it, and so you end up uh, having the following idea, which is kind of interesting. It's not that you would license it at fine granularity in terms of the code, you sort of license its output. Does your software, or, or regulate it at the point, rather, of, of, of output, are you accurate to, a, to some standard? What, what are good clinical practices for, for medical software development, if there is such a thing? That would be an interesting question. Um, do you like to patent the stuff you guys write? Do you write patents? Be, it'd be a sort of bad idea not to, only because if you spent all of these resources, you want to recover whatever you can recover, right? Um, we don't have enough experience with medical software patents to compare them to pharmaceutical industry patents, right? And maybe you could sell them, by the way, to, to, to Cerner or Epic to, to, to incorporate. I mean, the, the challenge we face now is decision support used to be these guys in garages, right, or in laboratories, writing really cool software. And now every Cerner, Epic, and GE system has got a decision support module on it. Uh, remember, decision support begins with alarms and alerts. Uh, when was the last time you were in an intensive care unit uh, and the alarms were functioning as intended and not being turned off? Right? That's a kind of decision support, right? Or ignore. Hey, hey, or ignore. Which brings back to usability, right? I mean, you can create whatever you want to be just accurate. But, but well, No, it's consistently inaccurate. You also get, or even if it is accurate, you get alarm fatigue is, is sort of the, the new diagnosis, right? The new malady that we get. My concern is, is that, the, that the really interesting and useful software, which I have no objection to being protected, uh, as, uh, having the IP protected, is actually not getting the kind of uptake that it needs to because we've settled it to a small number of vendors and institutions, <coughs> right? And I don't know if people negotiate with them or what. The, uh, the, the vendors themselves are saying the following. Uh, no matter what y you do, we want you to indemnify us completely. In other words, we can never be blamed at all for our software. It's all, once you plug it in, uh, that's that's a kind of customization that means that we're not responsible for it, and institutions will in fact sign those agreements. We all do. We want we want the software. Um, I think that's a funny sort of thing to insist on. Uh, there are other things you may remember. Uh, we were talking about one of the challenges that came up uh, uh, with uh, uh, with some very interesting work. An article published in JAMA that said that some of the contracts that vendors of software institutions write um, require that if you see a bug in the software in your hospital, you can't tell the physician next to you about that. You actually need to call a company because we don't want, we don't want people creating a, a lack of confidence in our software. Is that in the EULA agreement that you read? We've actually written a little bit about this saying that's, that's wrong, they shouldn't do that sort of thing. But those are the kind of agreements that they were in fact writing for a while, namely, we, this, treating this as if it were an ordinary IP product, when in fact you might have possibly said, uh, physicians have been talking to each other about tools for a long time. We may disagree, and I was happy to pay the price for the patent on the tool, but don't tell me I cannot speak to someone else if I discover there's a problem with it. I mean, it's one thing to write that into an agreement. It doesn't actually make it legitimate or enforceable. I, that, that's true. What's interesting is that they wrote it in the agreement, and then both parties were signing it. I mean, it, it does. It, it, it strikes me as utterly kooky. That's a technical term. Would have to 
um, that, that someone would actually think that, that, that you could go against a few thousand years of, of, of a profession by, by a sort of a diktat. You know, it's, it doesn't make sense. But they wrote it and people signed it. Uh, other stuff with vendors is, is quite interesting too. We leave it, but that, that, that's a separate topic, if I put that. Um, the, the challenges for, for the kind of things we're talking about is when we get to that tipping point, we are probably, uh, I mean, to say, spool the threads together now. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and I'm worried about the following. We probably ought to be using more decision support when we are. The stuff that's there, uh, that's, that some of it's good, some of it's not very good. It's presented not in a way that's maximally useful, I think, uh, the decision support. And it's not, it's not uh, appreciated by the kind of people who, who know what it is really good for. Like people, you know, people who know about, who know about uh, how, how, how predictions work, how you model them, and that sort of thing, like our, like our colleagues here. In other words, there, there's a beautiful opportunity to produce more and better tools, but our social mechanisms have so have so gummed things up, if not, not corrupted the environment, that we may not even realize the best of these tools. Right? I mean, if it's really up to Epic to make decisions about this sort of thing, uh, then how, how is your best software going to get used by clinicians? That's an interesting question. I mean, is it, it, you, you buy it, you take it home. I mean, uh, where, where do, how does that evolve? And I'm, I'm concerned there's a real impediment to the adoption of software that will improve the care of patients, in part because the, the, the vendor issues are, are so, are so mm, uh, uh, the challenges posed by the way things have evolved with a small, comparatively small group of vendors are, is, so, is, so, is so large. Yes? Yeah, all sorts of software has. Um, some software's also been shown not to improve the care of patients. Uh, beginning, the most, most common kind of software that people know about was a lot of research on is, is a computerized order entry. Um, we've actually discovered with all due respect, uh, what kind of practice? No general insurance. Okay. Um, the, 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 uh, the error, the you know, prescription errors, either caused by everything from handwriting to mistranscription to misreading to whatnot, this is actually a large number of patients. And if you get your act together with a good order of a computerized physician or provider or entry system, you can reduce a lot of those errors. Um, uh, there are also new errors that are cropping up, right, uh, caused by them. Uh, in our organization, uh, uh, the people who look at this, there, there are people who, who will say, look, the, co the computerization of medicine is un unavoidable to some extent. But there's a whole lot of stuff that's going on beyond, beyond the evidence, right? Um, <coughs> there's also a difference. This is, I think, a very interesting uh, question. We've, for years, been doing comparisons to cardiology, for example. Reading, reading electrocardiograms is, is, uh, is, is quite, a, quite a thing to be able to do. Uh, and it turns out, over and over again, the computers will diagnose MIs better than humans. They just will. Uh, better than most humans, anyway. Uh, the question is, how do you how do you move that from the, 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 the experimental domain to the actual practice domain? And that we're not used to yet. I mean, we haven't got we haven't got some of those mechanisms down quite yet. And in some cases, because there's great reluctance. In other cases, because it's there's there's no agreement on the on the kinds of standards and the kind of software uh, that ought to be used. Um, that, that we've been, I, I believe that some of us have been too shy about saying, no, once you've discovered this, you probably ought to, they're, they're, how about a clinical trial? Yeah. You know, we do this with drugs, we don't do it with software, uh, for the most part. We do case control studies, uh, you know, that sort of thing for software. Here, here, was the, here was the error for prescription rate before we introduced the Zico, here it is here, or, or, or preparing to make practices. Yes? I was just gonna say, it just seems like you have to, can you, can you assume that in, 20 years, there won't be wide use of, of this. And if, if that's the case, then you should just start thinking about um, you know, how to do outcome trials, comparing different different computer systems and identifying where they're different. There are I, different things that they're doing differently, that they use different probabilities of using. I mean, they're, they're explicit things. And then just actually start teaching people that in medical school. And then, you know what I mean? Maybe it just, it just has to be integrated. And if you just sort of wait, it, it is a problem. Oh, and we've been just waiting. What? We've been waiting. Right? In other words, we've done this very haphazardly because it's, I mean, 
Has anyone been through a curriculum reform at a medical school recently? What was it like? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, I was living it. It wasn't that fun. It's not. It's not fun. How? So I. I. I, so I, I want to say I'm afraid you're right. But, but, if, you, but if you Google something, if you have a patient, you sort of Google the literature before you see them. Depending on which, you know, if you use Google and Yahoo, you're going to come up with different, um, different articles, and there's going to be criteria, and there's going to be, you know, algorithms that get you different articles, and that may change how you use the person. So, you know, I mean, and 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 therefore, I I uh, at the end of the day, one of the ways that we answer some of these questions is just as, as you said, namely. When you're not sure about something, you need to do more research. I mean, our institutions are about finding out what, what all things being equal, what, what the empirical warrant is for one approach over another. And that seems to me to be the way that we need to do it. We haven't got the stomach or the budget yet to do it for certain kinds of things. And I think that's a real shortcoming. I think there are a lot of really uh, interesting and important ways that, that we will find that it's wrong not to use the student support system uh, because they're really accurate, but we, we, we're not adapting these tools quickly enough. Uh, and I think that's a problem. Once again, ethics is not about stop, slow down, don't do that. People mistake us for wanting to be naysayers. I think there's some times when we probably want to consider saying, you're, you're falling behind in the standard if you're not doing this. Uh, uh, and that may include secondary use of data, may include this more and more things about uh, 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 more trials uh, about this sort of thing. We have met great challenges in the world of human subjects research. I mean, we've gone from, you know, this, this, this uh, really simple, you know, here's one arm, here's the other, it's randomized, everybody knows the risks, and we've solved that problem, to, to, uh, to, to very complex research with crossover designs, bank tissue research, uh, different kinds of blinding. Our institutions approve sham surgery now. So we've, 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 we've managed to, to solve a great many problems in the world of human subjects research, except that we have yet to submit these exciting new intellectual computational tools to the same, to the same sort of tests. They're, they're, they're not, the, and, I don't, I, and I think there are opportunities for, for writing creative protocols that would do that. Yeah. So I think in terms of you know, clinical decision support and adoption, in my mind, I think it's going to follow the very same format that for the pharmaceutical industry has followed and how you know, a physician so there's a whole class of things that you know, as a physician you can prescribe a drug. I mean, you have certain guarantees because of the designs that were implemented to actually you know, show its efficacy, that it works, in devices as well. And I think you know, it's going to reach that point where it's, CDSS is going to be like a test. You're going to just send out for a test, and then it's going to come back. You don't have to know anything about the internals. And so for a lot of our drugs, we don't have to know exactly how they work. It helps, you know, if you want to you know, do some problem solving, but otherwise, we don't really need to know exactly how it works. We know what the endpoint is. And I think with the CDSS, is, as the industry matures, there's going to be more pressure to have things like randomized control trials and have things that can create that sort of guarantee. Whereas, physician, you can say, oh, yeah, you know, we'll use this uh, you know, PSS or there's some test, and uh, we know with the certainty that it's going to work and have this performance characteristics that we don't have to think about oh, what's going on inside, how they're working. So what would you say to the following question, though? That, that's a great point to make. What if, for the sake of argument, I said, well, but computer programs are different than drugs. And if it's, it's one thing to prescribe a drug and not necessarily, I mean, you need to know something about the mechanism of action, I suppose. Uh, I don't know how much biochemistry you need to know, and, and that, that's reasonable. But, but I think, wouldn't, wouldn't you say that if you're using a decision support system, that's a good question. What, how much should a physician who's not a computer uh, uh, person know about the uh, decision support systems that they use? Well, I mean, my answer to that is that some of the same metrics that are used to measure a you know, support system are the same metrics used to test, like uh, clinical tests for drugs, you know, sensitivity, recalls, precision, specificity. And I think that same language, clinical decision support can be coined in some of that similar language. Um, One could argue, I don't know that I want to or not, but the, 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 the nature of the tool is different. That when
patient's trust, which is crucial in terms of actually the day-to-day -day care of patients, is, is wildly affected by this. And I don't really have a lot of faith on a day-to-day -day basis with people who are marketing things to me. Right. And sure. so the what you're saying in terms of, but then also prospectively looking at the decision support system, as we prospectively look at drugs, not so well in general, right. better is, is vital. Right. Because people don't really trust, often don't trust what you say. And there's good reason for it. So I would just I would just say again, caution. Right. And I mean in all the same problems you have with drug development you have here too. Um, in terms of like so the cohort that was selected to, you know, to test the drug, was it the right cohort? It was different than your patients. Yeah. Same problem. CDSS, you have the same problem. Twelve percent yeah. of the patients right. that they died early. Right. And then they got and they didn't include the other data that they had to you know, so we live in a very imperfect system. Right. And oh now you tell me. I understand. Yes, of course. So, so uh, I, I want to draw to a close on 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 a positive set of notes. Once again, I I, I am convinced. Uh, I said this to somebody earlier. When, you know, when you're a hammer, everything's a nail. I'm convinced that these are these are great and under addressed issues by both the the, uh, the medical, the IT, and the bioethics communities. Uh, that that we fill our journals with all, all the questions we're talking. Every one of these topics is an article. You look at, you know the stuff that's in your journals. Most of it is 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 as as weightless and ephemeral as as uh, as as, uh, as as a newspaper article. Here are great questions that go to what is the core? What is it to practice medicine? What's the appropriate relationship between a doctor and a patient? What tools are are, are ordinary? Which ones are extraordinary? What stake does society have in supervising the use of those tools, and so forth? I think those are huge questions, and they are and we get the chance to ask them because we're interested in, in ethical issues related to the use of machines intelligence machines in medicine. So potential solutions are, it's, it's, it's either the refuge of scoundrels or, or uh, empiricist fetish, but we need more information about all of these things. One of the ways you answer questions is by more information and more data, and that's why the point of randomized trials, I think, is really important. I'd like to see a lot more data about uh, in critical care units, in, in internal medicine, and everywhere else, and, and in specialty practices with special problems. Right? We do this with everything else. I mean, we have journals, several journals dedicated to single organs. Right? Imagine. And of course, y'all y'all keep up on your reading, don't you? So so let's have some more data that will actually be useful as we adopt this new technology. We need to do a better job prophylaxing uh, against requests for inappropriate treatment. I'm uncomfortable using the computer said you die as as the as the trump card here. I think I think that we do a poor job collectively in managing patient and family expectations to begin with. And if you got to that point where you need to say, here, the computer says that's it, uh, then, then there's been an opportunity uh, to communicate and exchange and, and prepare for, for, uh, uh, for, for, for uh, uh, bad outcomes, if you will, or even good ones. That we need better policies for exception management, namely that uh, we, we we, we need to have some guidelines, but we also need, and this is true I think for evidence-based practice and practice guidelines, to make it clear when you can diverge from it. Uh, I'm sentimental and I, I, about, about the role of human cognition uh, and how certain kinds of cognitions are really quite complex and we can model them more or less, and at least for the foreseeable future, robo-doc ought not to be making uh, uh, certain kinds of decisions. But when it comes to futility, which I think is still uh, one of the largest uh, challenges we continue to face, and the use of these systems, that, that we, need, we need to help colleagues out I mean, I'd, I'd love to see a futility policy talk about the use of prognostic scoring systems, right? Uh, many of our institutions have futility policies. I mentioned there's one state that has legislation. Uh, the, the, the idea that there might be large-scale sources of objective data that answer these for individual patients, I think might be, might be an opportunity to develop more policies. And then I want just to close with the phrase progressive caution, which we coined uh, 20 years ago to say that we, that, that progress is unavoidable thank goodness, uh, that we are always going to be challenged by which tools to develop, which tools to adopt in the appropriate context of use, who's an appropriate user, what's an appropriate use. Uh, uh, but that's not an argument for not, for, for, for saying stop. It's an argument for saying take care. Uh, the values that we share I don't think have changed. The values are universal. 
uh, namely they have to do with the, the, what society and what pr pr dedicated professionals who find medicine they're calling uh, owe to the people who come to them in sickness and fear. What we need to do now is we need to give everybody the best possible tools uh, and study better how to use them. Uh, I think, uh, whereas normally ethics is about controversy, I think it's a beautiful thing that I said absolutely nothing controversial. Uh, comments or questions? Actually, so controversy is a wonderful, uh, we have a colleague who recently died, I don't know if you know Bernie Gert. Bernie Gert was a wonderful philosopher, uh, did a very important work in the philosophy of medicine about the definition of maladies. Uh, is, for example, um, uh, uh, in, in genetics and elsewhere, what's a trait and what's a malady? So therefore, is your genetic engineering enhancement or is it practicing medicine, right? And so some great questions there. He had a line, it was a wonderful line to say about ethics, it's oh, this is pretty straightforward, it's just, if I seem to say anything profound, you've probably misunderstood me. <laughs> yes? So, uh, have you, uh, you, you mentioned in passing very quickly that in your opinion, uh, pharmacogenomics has been kind of a failure. And I would be interested to find out in what sense, I mean, ethically or technically or medically or in, in what sense. And related to that, how would you contrast the molecular decision support systems that are popping up now with explosive rate with the, the clinical uh, old school, you know, that have been around. So no, uh, I don't think I don't. Th I, I I hope I have to review the tape actually. Uh, what I meant to say is that some of the results so far have been disappointing. Um, I, I, we really wanted we wanted to, we wanted to be able to customize some heparin there. We wanted to be able you know and, and, and that was that was the first example of, of pharmacogenomics that didn't go as intended. I am convinced also, and, and, and when it comes to bioinformatics or sort of molecular decision support systems, that. I'm actually guardedly optimistic that they will succeed in ways that will really excite people. They'll succeed in ways that will excite people in part because at the micro level, you're not dealing with those pesky patients and their behaviors, right? Uh, in, some, in some sense, it's, it's, uh, the biology of it is less um, friable. What do, you, what do you call it when a vein, when you're trying to, when you, uh, veins can be friable? It wiggles around too much. It moves around too much. What's the word for that? No. Rolling kind of fried it? No, fried it. Yeah, okay. That, that, that it's, it's less friable than the other stuff. And so therefore, um, that the kind of work that some of your colleagues are doing is actually going to be quite successful. That, that at that level of, well, it depends on whether you're a reductionist or not. I mean, I, I, I tend to be a reductionist about, about science, namely that if we understand the basic mechanisms, we can control them really well. And at the molecular level, there's going to be it's, there's great complexity, uh, but I don't think there's the kind of variation that's introduced in, in, in I mean, patient behavior, patient attitudes can affect these things. It's not to be a mystic. It's to say that there are certain things that are very hard to measure. Uh, in, in critical care and elsewhere. How many times have you been wrong in critical care about a prognosis? I don't, I mean, I, I'm not that way. That's, I, don't, I don't want to do that to you. I don't want to do that to you. You, you have, I assume, seen your colleagues be mistaken in, your prognosis. <laughs> <laughs> in, in other units and other institutions, right? But, uh, and, 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 uh, and so look, we're, we're fallible. I, so so I, I meant to say that so far the results have been disappointing. I'm, I would like, I've, We've been talking earlier, trying to make the case about the LC program in, in IT. It may be that the LC issues for bioinformatics are at least as interesting as those in the, the old school clinical boxes. You know, where you type, you, you know, here's some signs and symptoms, then you, you turn the crank and you put a quarter in to get a diagnosis. It's 50 cents now, I think. Uh, so I, I think some of these decision support systems are going to be used, and they're going to need to be very nimble because we're going to be need, look the the the, the students of Ten years from now, uh, uh, people practicing ten years from now, twenty years from now, what do you do? You take a buckle swab, you put it in your microarray, it lights up uh, software. Then that basically says, "Here's the molecular structure of this drug, and here's you." Uh, we're going to be doing some very interesting mapping and modeling that's going to basically be titrating or individually customizing drugs. 
It's all going to be computational, and it's, it's going to be as precise as you can make it. I'm optimistic about that, but that's a scientific question. Uh, I think the ethical issues about how you communicate about that to ordinary people, about when you hold it out, since even, it, you know, it, uh, you're treating one thing, but what your patient doesn't understand about gene environment interactions. And so it turns out you've got the right drug exactly, but then they go out and they have a drink or, or, or whatever it is that humans keep doing that frustrates us, right? Uh, I think the, the ethics in bioinformatics is, is, might possibly be one of the most important and under-addressed issues uh, in contemporary science. I'm excited by it, but I, you know, it's, it's in part because the work is so interesting. And you're right, and people want to do, prog they want to do predictors. I mean, we want to be able to, this is what science is about. It's being to predict and retrodict. It's being able to, to, evidence that we've got the right theory is found in predictions that conform to the theory. So predictive machines are very powerful for, for science in general. Two hands up, here's a minute. Uh, I'm an anesthesiologist, so uh, I occasionally deal with uh, the same problems that the interns do. But in a slightly different time frame and intensity. Uh, for example, uh, hypotension, uh, the hypotension that an internist may find is different than what I see in the operating room, which may be more related to blood loss and so forth. What gets tricky and where clinical uh, decision support would be helpful is when we deal with the uncommon problems of hypotension. Uh, yesterday, I was faced with a, a, a situation and it required additional information. So one piece would be to remind us, gee, don't forget to get an echo, or don't forget to look at uh, this or that, and fluoroscopy and bump. Um, but then once certain things are negative, then that changes your differential diagnosis. So um, when we're dealing with uncommon events and unique situations, this would be particularly helpful. But it has to be similar to uh, the decision support has to be appropriate for the patient population that you're dealing with. Well, and for, the, and for the clinicians who are asking for it. I mean, uh, what I would like to see in, in, in a perfect world is we can be much more nimble in writing support systems that were responsive to the needs of, of physicians. That's one thing. That the database needs to correspond as best it can be. But in the old days, you said to Dr. Welby or Kildare, what are my chances, Doc? And great decisions were based on that, sometimes with very little experience whatsoever. I don't want to make the job for physicians to be harder than it is. I mean, I think the fact is, that in rare cases, it's, it's irrational not to want decision support, which traditionally can be asking a bunch of your pals. To, to be able to model it in a way that's unbiased, I think, it, as, uh, I would, to be really quite useful. You know, it's support not, for your decisions, not decision support. If you ask your pals, it's more support for your decisions. Well, not if they're good pals. And not if your pals know they can disagree with you and say you've got it wrong. And not if you, uh, not if you go after you hear their advice reject it because you don't like you know. The nice thing about a computer is it, it produces this illusion. That's why, that's why some kooky websites, some of the stuff that... Uh, where did we go? Um, yeah. 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 He's working on some of the stuff he's doing is, is, uh, is, is related to this. Is, it, there are, there are websites, when you analyze how good something is, you might not have any relationship to how it looks. Certainly on the web, wouldn't it be interesting if there was something, if all the health plans are made on the web, to have some sort of way of tracking them to make sure that they were that they actually were of high quality. But, but, the, but, the, but uh, I, I think we, we have inadequate support in both directions. Like, given the money that we spend on some of the gadgets here, imagine if we just took a little bit of it and devoted it to, to some of the questions that people, when they start thinking about these, get excited by. Uh, especially when you get into the weeds, when you dig, when you learn about the stuff that uh, some of our colleagues are working on, uh, it's exciting, it's intellectually exciting, it's scientifically interesting, and it can be brought to bear in the care of patients in ways that are different than drugs, which is the way we've, we've often thought of technology in, in, in the past. Uh, well, one second, the, the two hands here. Yeah, so um, like if I were to design the CDSS for prostate cancer, I'd probably elicit some preferences of the patient. If you want to live to 80, you want to 90, how much do you care about urinary contents? And you have to take a lot of patient information and put it into these algorithms. And um, when I was doing work with smoking cessation, I would show people Excel sheets, like here's what happens if you quit smoking at 30 and 40. So a lot of these tools are rather than the doctors are going to be going downstream towards actual patients. So what concerns do you have for doctors in terms of 
uh, competently informing the patients when they've got this huge black box that they can't understand. So, so how can you sort of talk through that? Sure, uh, that's great. Okay, one of the questions we have is, is skill degradation in general. Uh, there's some interesting concerns about using certain kinds of tools that might, it's common, it comes in internal medicine all the time. Used to be that students could do this, this, and this, and now they only do this and this. And those other things might actually be quite useful. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about, uh, I think my job is to be professionally concerned. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so that everything is, is therefore grist from the mill in that way. Um, I don't think we do, a, with all due respect, and this may be, a, I'm, I'm sure if you come to a talk like this, you're definitely different and special. I think many of our colleagues who practice medicine and nursing are actually not very good communicators in the first place. Uh, and we do a terrible job in medical schools teaching uh, students how to do this. I mean, I, unless you guys are doing a really good job over here, I think I think most places are, are we, we do not devote a lot of time in the curriculum to this sort of thing. We may insist that this is an important part of the doctor-patient relationship. But boy, are we patient-centered, and this really net. And yet, when push comes to shove, they're learning, they're spending a lot of time with biologists, aren't they? Yeah. No time with you and anything about how to learn. And probably. They, they wheel the epidemiologist out and they do a thing in biostatistics and that goes by, but, but, it, but it's, it's a wink and a kiss. It doesn't do very much good at all for, for the sort of stuff that we're, that we're, that we're concerned about. So I, I, have, I have great concern. I think, I think that these things, all of these tools should come with kits that talk about appropriate use and that they we should have some fun with how to use them. Um, otherwise, I mean, I, the, the, the possibilities for different kinds of misuse of, of these tools including not being able to communicate with people about the back or just say, hey, here it is. I mean, here's your score. Here's your, I mean, the question I was asking you. Can you imagine the printout. Maybe here, here's all the numbers, here's the thing, and then the equal sign, you die. Right? I, I, there's some colleagues, if they had that functionality, they would use it, right? And so I, uh, I, I think that the, the appropriate, appropriate use of tools is, is a very interesting, interesting problem because we sometimes, I mean, patients will be using them themselves, right? I mean, I, 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 I imagine, I mean, my life and death situation, if you can buy, how much does it cost to buy it, really? They'll buy it themselves. Uh, and you'll see patients coming in with decision support uh, uh, output and, and lists of differentials and confirmatory tests that rule out the differentials that will cause you to blink your eyes saying, oh my goodness, happens already in some sense, right? Yeah. Uh, to the point that, to, to the extent that it's about communication, no helps to make your point. Patients already have lots of information, but information is one, and maybe not even always the most important component of medical practice, or so I want to argue. Uh, I think it's irresponsible not to use certain intelligent machines. And I think it's irresponsible to overuse certain intelligent machines. Sorting out when the appropriate time is, when the balance is, will be a great challenge, because when I say we have done a good job up to now with other stuff. I, in, in my practice, I think oftentimes it comes to be a, a question of first, not so much information, but accuracy. And people often, I mean, that sort of thing, people have a lot of information, but you have no the accuracy and reliability is what really, it, it's what the questions really are about. And we have all kinds of material every day that gives us graphs and charts, but there's never an error bar. There's never a well, mention of uncertainty. We're informed about everything. Um, my question is about the bearing of this on the conception of clinical judgment. At one point, I may have misheard, it sounded as if you were attributing to these machines, in some cases, clinical judgment. On the other hand, at other times, the machines, you say, do better than any physician, however celebrated. Um, so I guess, is this, this the thought? We won't really need to appeal to or need the notion of clinical judgment as these things proceed, because it's not just they'll sharpen our senses or makers better at a complicated judgment can be. But rather, they'll render the decision. It's, 
I guess it's a question about assistance. If, in fact, as you said, very often they do better than physicians, then it seems to me they're no longer, you can call them a tool, but it seems to me they replace physicians. It's not like a stethoscope, which sharpens the senses. Um, it's something that actually gives you an answer that is better come to believe that anyone you can arrive at. So, sorry, I guess the question is, I start, start with, well, what's the bearing of this on the very notion, the traditional notion of clinical judgment? So, if, so, that's a great question. Uh, I see we're out of time. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. I mean, it's, it's, It, depending on your software, you could argue, and I might be, be convinced to argue, that what the machine's doing is clinical judgment. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not, we, we, the, the language here, uh, uh, we use imprecisely sometimes. We, 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 see, we have, have acronyms that uh, reify decision support systems, embedding the idea of support. We don't call a stethoscope an auscultation support system. We, we call it a stethoscope, right? Uh, it, it, it maybe it does support it, maybe it's more convenient, maybe it's more accurate, maybe it's all of these things. If you have an inferential machine that actually is processing data the way a human does, but it does so more quickly and more accurately, then sooner or later, as I say, it's blameworthy not to use it. It has become the source of decision support. The but source of decision making sense, is critical judgment. In what sense does it assist the physician as opposed to Supplant. Supplant. Right. And the answer is, depending on how much of the practice of medicine is required beyond clinical judgment or beyond scientific inferences that apply in the case of an individual patient. So the task becomes then, as you suggested some of them, uh, is not making the decision or the judgment, but communicating it in a way that's acceptable to the patient and others. Right. And that's probably not going to describe as clinical, a form of clinical judgment that has to do, as you say, with communication. It's from clinical practice. I mean, look, well, yeah. the fact of the matter is, I, I, I actually don't know. Is it clinical judgment? Is it clinical? Sorry, clinical. You, you've come to the, uh, the, 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 the I, It's the middle of the night, uh, and it has to be on some of these in a while, and, and you get called, and you reach over, and you pick up your Washington man, and you do this. Is that, is that decision support? I mean, is it kind of decision support? It's, 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 and if you say, ah, that's exactly it, then you've looked up the answer in some sense. That's fine. No one would ever think that that's a bad thing to do or, or somehow impugn professional integrity, credibility, or any of those such things. In fact, that clinical judgment, which you have to know applied to your case, came from a book with pages. Nothing to click on. Imagine that case. Nothing to click on. Uh, it was in a book. Uh, and I would want to say that that's, you could make the argument that no more impugns the physician's authority and decision making uh, 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 importance than, than, than anything else. The, su the supplant augment distinction, though, is, is, is a great one. So you, you can imagine a per, uh, 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 it's more of a thought experiment than something that we need to worry about now. Uh, but coming down the pike, imagine a computer that really is better at doing this than every human all the time. Uh, in that case, you probably are, 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 are remiss in not using it. Then the role of the physician is, is it may involve, it may consist of things beside this, this thing called the clinical judgment. Uh, not a problem this afternoon, but it's one that I think is really important for us to answer because, I mean, 100 years ago, go back 100 years, go forward 100 years. I mean, it's, it's, what, what this did 100 years ago would look very much like what y'all did today. Uh, not at work, but, <laughs> but, but it would look very much the same. Uh, going forward 100 years, uh, to, to, uh, advanced practice nurse with a diet with a really good computer, uh, a well educated college student with a diagnostic expert system. Right? The, 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 a chiropractor. You know, what's that? A, chiropr a chiropractor. Right? A patient. Oh, okay, that's just it. I mean, when, when this is decentralized and patients can enroll their own this way. It will be a very interesting new world. And when, and 
and, and they might do that because depending on where our health system goes, it'll be cheaper to do that than actually. But I have no point. You may still have to get prescriptions. Yeah. It's good. Our job is to sign the prescriptions. Oh, yes. Sorry, folks. Oh, I'm, I'm looking for a cue to shut up. Uh, thank you all very much. It's been a real opportunity.